If you have your Bibles, that's wonderful. I'm not going to give you a specific text to turn to just yet because we are uh, going to be covering a, a topical uh, series over the next several weeks. And, I, and whenever I do a topical series, I like to give a little explanation because we typically don't teach uh, topically in this church. What, we, what our conviction is, is that we teach through the Word of God. We uh, find appropriate books to teach through, and we, and we teach through, as it were, verse by verse. We, we make our way through the text of Scripture, and that forces us in a very good way to, uh, uh, to hear the voice of God in the things that might be easy to hear and the things that might be hard to hear. We, we go through and we trust that He is using His Word to shape us, to, to mold us, and we don't want to come to a certain text that just might be a little more difficult, might be a touchy subject, and we say, you know, we're not going to address that because it's just too hard. If we come to that in Scripture, we address it uh, appropriately. So, But every once in a while, we find that it is uh, important to do a topical series. Our our last topical series, we did one on the law and gospel, and that was important as we were about to go through the book of Deuteronomy. And we needed to see how is it that we as believers are meant to uh, apply, encounter the, the law of God. What does the law have any hold over the believer anymore? If it does, and it does, then how do we live our lives in accordance with it? Is, do we live our lives as certain texts of Deuteronomy gave specific instructions to Israel, or were those ju laws just for Israel? You need to deal with those things, so it was appropriate at that time to have that, that mini-series. Well, as the elders met just coming off of Deuteronomy, which we finished a couple weeks ago, thought, let's do a mini-series on worship, because there's worship is a key theme in Deuteronomy, as God gives us instructions for how, why we ought to worship Him, and even how we ought to worship Him. So we're going to do a little mini-series on worship, and then going through uh, the end of this mini-series, and probably through the summer, we're going to be looking at the Bible's hymn book, the Psalms, and looking at various Psalms and just enjoying uh, the Psalms together. But why, why a, a mini-series on, on worship? Why would, we, why would this be an important thing for us to understand? This is kind of one of the things we're going to look at this morning in this very first uh, sermon in the series. Why do we want to do a mini-series on worship? What is worship? And we'll see how we are created for worship, how the fall has corrupted our worship, and then how in Christ we are recreated for worship. But before I dig in, uh, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll begin looking at the Word. Father, as we come before your Word this morning, I just pray that you would strengthen us to receive it. Help us to come before your word knowing that it is indeed the word of God. It is your very word to us. It is the word that reveals Christ to us. It is the word, Father, that helps us to know how we ought to live our lives in obedience before you. How through the, the saving grace that you've given us through Christ with no no merit, no, no reason in and of ourselves, we can worship you and turn and live lives in delightful obedience before you, not earning your favor, but simply responding out of gratitude for what you have done for us in Christ. I pray that as we enter this mini-series on worship that you would help us to walk away just with a greater delight in who you are that our hearts would just be set aflame with the love that you have poured out upon us in Christ. Help us to be a people who truly delight in you. I pray that you would work 
your, the, your spirit would do what he can only do through your word, through my voice as a sinner in need of your grace. And Father, through our ears as, we're, as we are hearing your word, we are all sinners. We, are, we all come before you, Father, confessing our sin. We've sinned before you in thought, word, and deed. We fall far short of your glory, and yet you have reached down and rescued us through your Son. So prepare us now. Help us to believe your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to obey it. Even in our weakness. Strengthen our faith. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So yeah, first, why? Why a, a mini-series on worship? Well, First, let's think of this. I was thinking of one of my favorite works of art. It's Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's, it's currently in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. And if you've never seen the painting, it's a depiction of Christ's parable of the prodigal son. And it's the father kind of in his kingly robes and his son kneeling down before him, coming to, coming to him, and the son is in his rags, having come from the, the farm where he had been feeding the pigs and, and eating this, the same muck that the pigs had been eating. So you have the son in his filthy rags, dirty, and coming, and the father in his rich clothing, has greeted his son back, has welcomed him back. And, but as you look at the various layers of the picture, you see different people depicted, different people kind of, some more prominent, some more in the background, the, the older son kind of peering in, like what is happening? This should not be happening. Others looking in, perhaps the mother in the, in the far background, perhaps the, the, the foreman of the property there looking in at, in amazement at this display of love. That it, it's a beautiful painting. But imagine, imagine taking something like that painting, which should be hung rightly so, for people to come and look at and look at the intricate details of it, to look back in the shadows at the, the, fa- the details on each face, to see all those things. But imagine, instead of using it for its proper use, you took it off the wall because you had a table sitting in the corner that had lost one of its legs, and you're like, I'm going to put this painting under it to kind of prop this table up. Or you say, it's a snowy day. And my snow shovel broke. Hey, that frame is sturdy. I'm going to take that painting and, and shovel the sidewalks with it. Maybe more appropriate, the, the sewer has backed up. And you're using this precious painting to clean out the gutter. The painting was created to be enjoyed, to convey a, a picture of, of one of our Lord's great parables, a parable of, of grace and mercy. And you take that painting that is beautiful and you use it for something it was not created for. That's very much what worship is. We are we're created to worship God, and it's of vast importance that we fulfill the purpose that we were created for. It's of vast importance that we do the very thing that God has created us to do, to worship Him. And when we don't worship Him, we are treating this thing that we are created for and using it basically to shovel the muck out of the gutter. Calvin said, as I recently said in the Deuteronomy series, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. So our devotion to God is always under attack. So we need to know, first off, what true worship is. 
than how we can, can fix our worship, can fix our hearts on the proper object of worship. So again, a few points this morning. What is worship? We'll see how we were created for worship, how the fall corrupted our worship, and then finally how we are recreated for worship. Well, as we think about worship, kind of to give a bare bones definition, worship is a wholehearted devotion to someone or something. I, I was thinking... Lately, I've been thinking a lot of songs as I'm working through these sermons, but I was thinking, Larry and I were talking about John Denver last time I mentioned John Denver. You can tell I'm a bit of an old soul because the song that I thought of was Frank Sinatra's Fly Me to the Moon. I used, I, this one that I would sing to my boys at night for some reason, and they would always love it. Every once in a while, they'll still ask for it. But Sinatra is singing this song to the one he adores. And that's exactly what he says in the line. He says, you are all I long for, all I worship and adore. He is singing about a, a wholehearted devotion to this love that he has. This is what worship is. It's a wholehearted devotion and it's meant to be a wholehearted devotion to God. The first table of, of the law that we looked uh, through in, the, in our studies in Deuteronomy really focus on this idea of worship, the understanding that God alone is God. God alone is the true God. Since he alone is God, he, we are not to worship any false gods. Since he alone is God, he determines how he will be worshipped. So we have the laws about no idols, no man-made images. We're not to worship God with the vain imagination, imaginations of our heart, but how God has directed us to worship. And you'll hear this wholehearted devotion as not only Deuteronomy, but Christ gives the summary of the law when he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. That is describing a wholehearted devotion to God. We are loving him with all of our faculties. There's various words in the Old Testament, the New Testament, that we Typically, our, our, Bible, our English Bible translations will translate as the word worship. They have various meanings. Uh, they think they speak of service. They, they speak of honor and reverence. They speak of submission. All of these things giving to, to God and even thinking of our Easter morning sermon in, from Revelation 5 I mentioned Revelation 4, but think of the, the, ver the, the songs that we hear sung before the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And then the similar line is sung of Christ, the Lamb of God. He is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and praise. He is worthy as our creator to receive all worship. All of his creation ought to be bent to worshiping him. But as we see in our next point that we were created for worship, people were created specifically as his special creation to give God worship. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 as we read a couple verses from here. I think mostly this morning will be in Genesis, Romans, and Ephesians. Genesis 1, verse 26. It says, Then God said, let us make man in our image 
after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the, bir- over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We are created, as I said, mankind created especially of all the creatures, of all the creation, man was created especially to give glory and honor and praise, worship to his creator. We were created as God's image bearers to, to populate the earth, to fill the earth with his, like, with his likeness. Think of maybe Ephesus, as we're thinking of Paul's uh, missionary journey through Ephesus, and we have this whole uproar over the, 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 the goddess Artemis or Diana and, and the silversmiths who are making the idols. But as you have Ephesus in their pagan worship, they have the large temple to Artemis with inside the, the large idol, the large statue of their goddess. But then you have the silversmiths who are making their living, making these little idols that the uh, people who live in Ephesus, the citizens of Ephesus will, will buy and they will put in their homes and in their businesses. So you have the, the main image of this goddess, but they are filling their homes, they are filling their lives with these other images. In a very real sense, they're filling their city with the presence of their false god, this goddess Diana. Well, this is what this language is for us as, as God's special creation created in his likeness, bearing his image and told to populate the earth, to, to, to be fruitful and multiply. We are meant to go through as God's image bearers to fill the earth with his image. We are the image of God, and we are to populate the earth so that the glory of God fills the earth as his image bearers go forth. This is why Christ says, as the scribes and Pharisees come and challenge him about paying taxes, and he asks for the coin. And they give him a coin, and he says, whose, whose image is on this coin? And they say, Caesar's image is on the coin. And he says, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God's. The idea there is the coin has Caesar's image on it. So pay your taxes to the government. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. What bears for Christ? What bears my image? You do. Humanity does. Render unto God the things that are God's. Paul says in Romans 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We are created as image bearers, to, we, to worship God. We are created, as the Shorter Catechism says, to, to glorify and enjoy Him forever. We are created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We were created for worship. Turn over, though. As we know, the story quickly changes in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Beginning with verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God 
walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and this is just after they had eaten from the, from the forbidden tree. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And then skip down to verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. As sin was ushered into the world through Adam, we see this separation from the special presence of God. As sin corrupted man, not only does man immediately run and hide from God, but God also puts him out of the garden, this special garden that was meant to be enjoyed in the presence of God. God removes man from the garden. There's a separation from the, sp the, the special presence of God. And we understand that God is everywhere present. It's what we call his omnipresence. He is everywhere present. But we begin to see as the Bible unfolds that there is God's omnipresence that he, yes, he is everywhere present, but there is also a special presence of God. So we understand as we see in scripture a a general sense that we speak of worship, but also a more narrow or specific sense that we speak of worship. We'll be getting into that kind of more narrow sense next week and through the rest of the series. But as you think just kind of about those two categories or those two spheres, you can think of the, the broad sense of our worship as, as Paul instructs the Corinthians, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And he says that in the context of a, a private meal. More narrowly, more narrowly together, what we would call corporate worship, what we understand is coming together like this on a Sunday morning to worship. There is something special that happens. We'll talk about that more next week. Today, as we just think more broadly about what worship is, we understand that the fall corrupted our worship. Turn with me to Romans, Romans chapter 1. Paul in opening up this wonderful godliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The fall corrupted our hearts. And notice what Paul says. Worship the creator, but the creation. We look at the at created things and though we behold their beauty, behold the goodness that they, that they have and the design and the wonder of it, we stop just there. 
We don't see the creator, the artist behind the creation. And it goes further than just not seeing him. We purposefully, in our, in our sinfulness, ignore that the creator even exists. And we turn and make these creations the objects of our worship. As we say many times, it's, these days we typically, I would hope, no one has in their homes a, a small little temple set up with their idols inside. But our hearts do that all the time. Our hearts set up all sorts of little idols. Things that we find our greatest delight in. But instead of our delight and the focus of all our faculties being focused on God, the fall caused mankind to turn from God and to worship things that are no gods at all. That's the bad news. The bad news is rather than delighting in and worshiping, honoring, praising, glorifying God, glorifying our creator, we are turned in, our, in our, the corruption of our hearts to worship, to glorify, to praise, to serve things that are no gods at all. The good news, though, is that God has recreated us for worship. God has recreated us for worship. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning with verse 1, Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spins of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul's describing as God created us in his likeness to be fruitful and multiply, to multiply his image around the world. He here, Paul says, we are his workmanship. He has made us. He has designed us. He has crafted us. For what? Well, that we are the creation in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So though the fall corrupted us and separated us from God, we are created anew in Christ. And as new creations in Christ, we are a workmanship designed to do the things that God has made for us, created for us, determined for us to do. As new, as new creations, we're being conformed to the image of Christ. Christ. As new creations, the image of God in us is being renewed. Turn just over the next page to Ephesians 4. Beginning with verse 17. As Paul speaks about this new life that is ours in Christ. 
He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Just notice a few things from this passage related to us as recreated beings, recreated for worship. First, he says that the... He says that the light of Christ shines into our darkened minds as, as he compares the darkened minds of us as, as unbelievers. We understand that our darkened mind, the darkness is chased away by the, the brightness of Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, that God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. We're no longer alienated from God. As verse 18 says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. We are no longer alienated from God as these new creatures, new creations. We're no longer ignorant but we know the truth of Jesus, the truth that is in him. In verse 23, we are renewed in the spirit of our minds to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So you have the original creation where God created man in his likeness to be his image bearers. The fall corrupts it so that we are no longer worshiping God as his bearing his likeness and image and being his image bearers and giving glory and honor and praise. We are no longer worshiping God, but worshiping the creation. But in Christ, we are recreated. And as Paul says here, again, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. And as we are more and more conformed in the image of Christ, we are more and more bearing, showing the world around us the likeness of God, manifesting his righteousness and his holiness. As we are conformed more and more to the image of Christ, we take up again that mandate to be fruitful and multiply. We, we fill the earth, but we're not filling the earth with our own glory that, like we did in our sinful state, but we are filling the earth with his glory. Paul says again in 2 Corinthians, he describes himself as, a, as, as an ambassador for Christ, a minister of reconciliation, and really as, as Christ's image bearers that are going into the world and filling the, the, the world with his image, with his glory. That is exactly what we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're proclaiming God's reconciliation to the sinful world around us. And so we think about how we're recreated for worship. We have to realize that we have all the more reason to worship God now than we ever had before. At one point, mankind is created in his image. But after the fall, as God comes down and stoops down to show us his love and grace in the face of Jesus Christ, we no longer just have the creature-creator relationship. 
but we in a more full sense have the creator's love poured out upon us because we are the ones that, that rebelled we are the ones that fled God didn't walk away from us. We rebelled against him and ran away. And yet, like the parable of the prodigal son, it's, it's God who welcomes us back, who brings us in, who clothes us in the righteousness of Christ, who embraces us, who sets a feast before us. We have all the more reason to worship because of the love of God poured out upon us in Jesus Christ. Because we, like the prodigal son, standing there in our, in our filthy rags, reeking of a, of a pigsty, we can see God's loving embrace upon his wicked sinner. It's all the more reason for us to worship him. We are objects of God's love. The God who created the heavens and the earth placed his love upon you. So much so that he sent his son to come and take on humanity to suffer, be tempted in all the ways that we are tempted yet without sin, to step into our place, to, to live that perfect life of obedience, a perfect life. If you think about a life of worship, Christ is the one who lived a perfect life of worship, always giving glory to the Father in all that he did. Every thought, word, and deed that he did was to the glory of the Father. He lived a perfect life of worship, and yet that one who lived a perfect life ended up dying on a cross, suffering the wrath of his father, not against his sins, but against our sins. So you think with the, the hymn, what wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this that God would rescue me, that God would die for me, that Christ Jesus, the man, would die for me. That he would suffer the wrath of his father upon him, the wrath that I deserve to suffer in all eternity. What wondrous love is this. And he is conforming us more and more into the image of his son as he, re, as he has recreated us for worship. Next week we'll see how God especially uses the, the corporate gathering of his people to conform us to the image of Christ. But to, to close out today, I think it's important that we just consider what do we do with this. As we have seen that man is created for worship, as we've seen how the fall has corrupted our worship, and we understand that God through Christ has recreated us for worship, but what do you do with that? Where do you go from here? And I think the question is singular. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which you were created? Are you fulfilling the purpose for which you were created? Are you worshiping God? Do you strive? Even if in our sinfulness, we understand it's not perfect. That's to come in glory. But do you strive to have a wholehearted devotion toward God? Do you delight in him? 
The first thing, as we consider if you're fulfilling your purpose for which you were created, the first thing is you must be reconciled to God. Because if you are sitting here and you are not yet, you do not yet have saving faith in Christ, you are sitting here, you have not yet been recreated for worship, you must first be reconciled to God in Christ. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And that is the message that we preach every Sunday. We are specifically addressing the saints, those are, who are new creations in Christ, but we know that this body is, is, a, is a mixed body. Like the likelihood is that there are those sitting here who are not yet, who have not yet been reconciled to God, who have not yet been recreated for worship. So the first thing is we implore you, we urge you to be reconciled to God. If you do have faith in Christ, if you have been reconciled to God, you are a new creature. Then live a life of worship unto the only worthy object of worship. Knock down, grind up, burn all of those idols of the heart that hold your devotion and worship the only worthy object of worship, your creator. Praise him for what he's done for you in Christ. Submit to him, serve him, honor him in all that you do. Give glory to him. Show him reverence and awe. Enjoy him. He has given us all these good gifts in Christ to enjoy. Put to death the deeds of darkness. Put on Christ. Live in the holiness of the new creation. And fill the earth. If you are a new creation in Christ, you know the love of God poured out for you in Christ, then don't hold on to that and hide it. But go forth, be the image bearer that you're created to be and shine the face of Christ on the world around you. Share the love of Christ that God has poured out upon you. Share it with the world around you. Share it with one another. Encourage one another. Those who believe, it's a sweet thing to sit down next to someone and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and they respond, yeah, yes and amen, I believe that. And you meet your brother or sister. As we talked about in Sunday school, God's word never returns void. You may sit down and share your faith in Christ, you may share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone and they may outright reject you. But you never know what happens down the road. You never know if 15, 20, 30 years down the road, they are in the depths of despair and God through the Holy Spirit reminds them of the good news of Jesus Christ that they once heard on the park bench sitting next to some stranger. And they cry out to God, and right then they became a new creation, an image bearer. As those who bear God's image, those who bear God's likeness, go out into the world, fill the world with his presence, shine the light of Christ. Remember, as Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That is good news. As I said, in the, fall, the coming weeks, we will examine what kind of the more narrow focus on worship, seeing how 
God blesses the, cor- the corporate gathering of his people and, and how he works in that. But for now, as we come before the Lord's Supper this morning, something we celebrate every week, remembering what God has done for us in Christ, remembering the great love that he has poured out upon us in Christ, obeying him by, by taking these elements together, understanding that this is one of the ways that he has given us to be fed and nourished upon Christ so that we can be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. If you are here this morning and you don't believe the good news of the gospel, you don't believe that God has sent his son to reconcile sinful man to himself, if you don't believe that, we would ask that you allow these elements to pass you by. But we do not want you leaving in that state. We want you to be reconciled to God in Christ. We want you to believe the good news of the gospel. If you are here this morning and you know the good news of the gospel, you believe it, you trust in Christ. Though your faith may be weak, this table, that these elements are for you because it is through this that God nourishes us. We sit down for the small feast and we recognize, we see in it the beauty of our union with Christ that he, we have been so closely tied to Christ that he is ours and we are his and that through the union with Christ we're united to one another So we take it and enjoy this meal in communion with one another. Take it and feast and be encouraged on Christ. Let me pray and we'll take it together. Father, I do pray that as we come before this meal, the Lord's Supper, that you would strengthen us through it. That you would nourish us on Christ, spiritually speaking, conforming us more and more to his image. I pray, Father, that you would help us as we understand that in our sinfulness, our rebellion, we worship all the things that are not worthy of a single ounce of worship. But help us to take this remembering what you have done for us in Christ, that you have recreated us to worship you. Help us to spread your glory around the world. Help us to flee from our own glory. Help us to honor you, to praise you, to serve you, to submit to you. Father, help us to do all these things knowing that we're not doing them to earn salvation, but doing them because you have already saved us in Christ and it is simply heartfelt gratitude. Help us to be a people who present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Our worship before you. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.